speaker is uh, Jason Karlowish, uh, Professor of Medicine and Medical Ethics and Health Policy, Director of Neurodegenerative Diseases, Ethics and Policy Program, and Associate Director of the Penn Memory Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Continuing a theme, while he did his MD at Northwestern, he trained in internal medicine and geriatrics at Hopkins and the University of Chicago, a nice axis. And you get 30 minutes as our keynote for this session. Welcome, uh, Jason. Good to see you. Well, thanks, Dan. <laughs> Oh, it's it's uh, great to be here. Thank you. The 26th annual McLean Conference. It occurred to me when I thought about that number as a geriatrician that, Mark, you have just about trained a generation and that, that uh, very soon you will have a fellow come who was born when this program started. <laughs> that, is, that is really spectacular. So, I saw your grandfather, yeah. So how are we going to live with Alzheimer's disease? I raise this question because I will posit that I don't think a cure is in the offing, and so we're going to have to learn how to live with the disease. And what I want to talk about are the uh, ethical challenges related to current efforts to uh, answer this question. In particular, I want to address the challenges related to efforts to transform the diagnosis from the category of individuals who are demented as a result of Alzheimer's disease to a continuum defined by various risk markers. And what I'll speak about are both two, uh, two broad categories of challenges. First, uh, challenges related to conducting the research to arrive at this new world of a dimensional construct. And secondly, I'll uh, speak of the challenges as we arrive at that world and to translate it into our daily lives. Just a bit of background, I study this issue around the ethical, legal, and social issues related to cognitive aging. Alzheimer's has been a very useful disease paradigm. Uh, I also take care of patients at the Penn Memory Center uh, uh, where I deal with some of the issues I'll be talking about uh, on a uh, weekly basis. The, the disease of Alzheimer's disease is named after this physician, this gentleman here with the spectacles, Dr. Lois Alzheimer's. Uh, who in around 1907 wrote his case of an unusual disease of the cerebral cortex. He was referring to this patient here, uh, Auguste D, who uh, subsequently, her, uh, her name has been known, Auguste Dieter, who was brought in by her husband with the chief complaint was, she's not cooking me dinner and she won't have sex with me. Um, and uh, that was his complaint. She was sexually jealous and therefore not doing the duty of a wife. Um, Alois Alzheimer's described a sick person. She was ill, she was demented. And he knew that, the, he, he believe, believed based on his assessment that there was something unusual about her. She wasn't presenting as many of the other cases uh, at the asylum were. And kept tabs at her. And it's an interesting side note to the story. Many of you, of course, know about this story, but one fact which is relatively uh, not spoken about is he, he had to leave to go follow his mentor, Emil Kreplin, to another hospital. She, of course, remained back in the uh, asylum where he first met her. And he kept tabs about her. Uh, and um, along, uh, uh, one of his updates he received told him that her husband was tired of paying the cost of her care in the asylum and was going to move her to a lower grade state asylum where it would be cheaper. This, of course, meant that Alois Alzheimer's would lose track of his unusual case of a disease of the cerebral cortex. He was a neuropathologist as well, and he knew what he wanted. And uh, fortunately, uh, he had married well, Dr. Alzheimer's, and began to uh, supply uh, the cost of her monthly asylum care until she died. And then, of course, her brain was captured, banked. And he then engaged in the classic act of clinical pathologic correlation, where he described only a tangle of fibrils indicate the place where a neuron once was previously located. I think this story is interesting as it captures three things about Alzheimer's disease, which dominated much of the 20th century. Someone else is complaining about a problem in someone. That someone is disabled. And um, the challenges of taking care of these patients in terms of both social and economic challenges, namely the family was, tired, was running out of funds to pay for her. And in this case, research funds stepped in to keep things going, his own private funds. The other feature of the case, of course, is it was an act of clinical pathologic correlation, a bedside diagnosis, a sick patient with a history. Ultimately, tissue was obtained, and that history and that tissue were matched up to arrive at the diagnosis. 
And, and this graph just kind of depicts the way we understood Alzheimer's disease through much of the 20th century. Simply what I'm describing there is, is on the x-axis is people are normal until they start to develop signs and symptoms. Uh, meeting criteria for dementia, chronic progressive losses in cognition that are disabling, or perhaps an emerging construct of MCI, which I'll explain in a minute, and over time, of course, they're getting worse. So th this is the disease that I trained in. It's a categorical status-based diagnosis. That is to say, you are ill, and that illness based on a history and physical, and et cetera, I believe is most likely explained by the pathology, which Alois Alzheimer's described in his case report. The concept of MCI began to be created towards the latter part of the 20th century when studies that captured individuals who had impaired memory, uh, episodic memory performance, who then were followed over time, it would begin to show that they were stratifying themselves into being more likely over time to develop dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And, and so by the late 90s, we were beginning to accumulate data that said that you could take an actuarial view of this disease and see forward into its future before it was developing. And at the same time that clinical data were being gathered on those people with MCI, so too were biological data. Imaging scans such as MRI, metabolic imaging such as a PET scan, spinal fluid samples. And the result was this. This is the new vision of, of Alzheimer's disease, which is emerging now, which is this vision not so much of the bedside diagnosis, a sick wife brought in by her husband complaining that she's not cooking and doing the wifely duties he expected, to a dimensional diagnosis described by a variety of different markers which will signify where you are along the cascade of developing the disease. And so, in addition to the category of having dementia from Alzheimer's disease on the far right, or mild cognitive impairment, now has emerged the idea that you could have preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Now, I realize this is a session on clinical ethics, but maybe now it's a session on preclinical ethics. <laughs> and, and what I've done in this very busy slide that is, was created by Cliff Jack at the Mayo Clinic uh, is uh, Dr. Jack began to describe how even before there are the functional losses, there is on that blue line the beginning of psychometric changes. So you're not functionally impaired, but you're not doing as well on cognitive testing as would be expected. And even before that, we see changes on your MRI. In other words, your hippocampal region is not as uh, uh, filled with tissue as we would expect. And even before that, we can see that the physiologic activity of your brain on PET scan. And even before that, we can measure plaques of amyloid and, uh, and, and, and tangles of tau, the things that Alois Alzheimer's observed with a microscope, in his post-mortem specimen, we can observe them with pet imaging in life. And so this uh, concept of Alzheimer's disease as this continuum described by these markers has animated the research uh, uh, world. At the same time, uh, at the very beginning of the 21st century, uh, the United States Congress and uh, President Obama did one of their rare bipartisan pieces of legislation over the last uh, uh, six years and passed the National Alzheimer's Project Act. And the National Alzheimer's Project Act uh, is a federal effort to create a national plan for Alzheimer's disease. And it has six goals. And one of those six goals is to prevent Alzheimer's disease or cure it by 2025. So the clock is ticking now to do just that. So what I want to talk about are the efforts that are underway, many of them with taxpayer support in conjunction with industry, to do uh, uh, research that is hoped to allow us to achieve the goal of preventing the disease by 2025. Uh, this, by the way, is just an image of, of, of that PET imaging, just to kind of further uh, show, give you a little bit of an illustration of it. So, so on the uh, far uh, right here, you see severe Alzheimer's disease, meaning Alzheimer's disease dementia. And this is a, a PET imaging that lights up tau, the tangles, and you can see here tau pathology. And this is someone with mild stage Alzheimer's disease dementia. And, and this is what's provocative, of course, is that you know, someone who has MCI has just a little bit of that pathology. Now here I've shown you someone who's cognitively normal who has none, but of course what the field has discovered is that you can find, oh, sorry about that, you can find a group of individuals who are cognitively normal, but have uh, evidence on PET imaging of tau or amyloid that looks a lot like someone with mild Alzheimer's disease dementia. So it's this emerging idea of the preclinical presentation of the disease. So 
what are we investing in right now as a society? Well, we are investing in the trial as what I call an instrument of validation. Now, I know we typically think of clinical trials as uh, science studies done to improve the lives of patients, show that, 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 that a treatment works. And that's what all the trials that I'm going to tell you about here are designed to do. But they're also designed to do uh, another uh, thing, which is act as a, a criterion validation exercise. So you take a group of people and you give them an intervention and you measure something about those people. And, and, the, and you give some of the intervention and some you don't give the intervention. And, and if you see that the people who get the intervention do differently on the thing that you're measuring about them, say cognition, you can argue that your intervention targeting your biomarker that and, uh, linked to cognition validates the link between the biomarker and the cognition. So for example, in the anti-amyloid and asymptomatic Alzheimer's study, older adults between the ages of 65 and 80 have a PET scan that measures whether they have elevated amyloid or not. They're cognitively normal. Uh, they would not be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease dementia. They would not be diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. They would be called normal. But their PET scan shows elevated amyloid. They are being enrolled in a trial where they're assigned to an anti-amyloid drug or a placebo in a blinded fashion followed over three years with cognition measured. The goal would be to show that if you can intervene on amyloid and change the rate of decline on cognition, now this thing called elevated amyloid in a cognitively normal person becomes the disease of Alzheimer's reified through elevated amyloid linked to this, ther this, this drug. So uh, that's this concept that's emerged of the theranostic, a diagnostic and a therapeutic linked together in an individual who's coming to you with no complaints or symptoms. So that study is ongoing right now. So in that study, individuals' um, challenges, should we tell them or not the result of their PET scan? Should they be told that they have elevated amyloid or not elevated amyloid and therefore either are or are not eligible for the clinical trial? And I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. The second study I have here uh, that is ongoing now is the DIANE study or the dominated, Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network trial. This trial harkens back to Auguste D, whose, whose brain specimen was found in, the, in, a, in a pathology lab uh, in Germany. And uh, she is a carrier of one of the dominant mutations that lead to Alzheimer's disease dementia, the pre mutation. And, and individuals who carry this dominant mutation, if they live long enough, generally into about their 40s, no more than about their late 50s, will develop Alzheimer's disease dementia. Uh, uh, it's very different than the presentation of Alzheimer's disease typically uh, in the 70s. The average age of a patient with Alzheimer's disease in America is about 75 years of age. But what these individuals represent is, if you will, a group who are at heightened risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And so what the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network has done is gathered together across the United States and the world families, individuals who have this gene in their family, and, and uh, enrolled them in a clinical trial to test anti-amyloid agents these individuals are cognitively normal, but they have the gene. So of course the question is, is, is part of the enrollment criteria, do you tell them indeed now you do carry this gene, so therefore that's why you're eligible for the trial, or do you not tell them that, and how do you design the study to do that? The third study there is the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative study. Uh, they are doing two studies, actually. One involves individuals with this dominantly inherited gene who are residents of the Medellin, Colombia region, in, in Colombia where there's a very large uh, 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 cohort of uh, families since about the uh, 18th century who have lived there uh, who carry the pre mutation. The other study they're doing, which I'll focus more on, is a study that will enroll individuals who are carriers of two copies of the APOE4 gene. The APOE4 gene has been associated with the increased risk of developing late onset Alzheimer's disease, the Alzheimer's disease we see in the late 60s or 70s. And if you have two copies of that gene, you're uh, described as having uh, the highest risk based on a variety of longitudinal cohort studies. It's only about 4% of the population carry about two copies of the gene. And if you have that uh, uh, carrier, uh, if that genetic profile, your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease depends on the study you look at, but it could be as high as 80 or somewhere between about 60 to 80% lifetime risk if you live to about 85 years of age. 
So that will be another randomized trial enrolling these people at heightened genetic risk to determine whether we can change the rate of decline in very sophisticated measures of cognition. Because again, like the A4 study, like the Diane study, these are all cognitively normal individuals. And finally, the Tomorrow trial also uses ApoE4 gene as well as another gene that's been uh, discovered to increase risk. Uh, same design, cognitively normal individuals randomized to drug or placebo based on having those genes. So I hope the message I'm giving you is a message that harkens back to the early days of cardiovascular disease therapeutics. So one of the big breakthroughs in cardiovascular disease therapeutics was gathering together cohorts of individuals who carried dominant genes for familial hyperlipidemia. These were individuals who by their 30s had cholesterol plaques on their tendons uh, and by 40 were having heart attacks and strokes and generally dead of cardiovascular disease. They were enrolled in a clinical trial to test uh, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, which lowered their cholesterol value, decreased the risk of having a heart attack or stroke, and therefore established the fact that cholesterol was, an, was a causal part of the pathway of cardiovascular disease, and the rest is, of course, the story of Lipitor and the rest of us, because, of course, familial hypercholesterolemia is quite rare. And so these studies, particularly the bottom three, are very much modeled on that idea of go find me a genetically uh, otherwise biomarker heightened risk group of people to help validate the construct of labeling people before they have a heart attack, or in the case of Alzheimer's, before they're demented. Again, part of this vision of prevention by 2025. Where would we like to be? Well, if you talk to the folks in Alzheimer's disease, this would might be their vision. This is a bus kiosk on 12th and Market Street in my hometown of Philadelphia. I don't know if you can read this sign on the side of the bus kiosk, but it says, uh, know your risk, know your A1C. Hemoglobin A1C, or the biomarker measure, if you will, of diabetic uh, uh, the presence and, and severity of diabetes. Uh, the graphic depicts a ambulance that seems to be crashing into a living room because ahead of the ambulance are, is, I presume, it's Hank and his wife, and on the side of the, uh, the ambulance says, "Hank, diabetes complications are coming to get you." And so the message here is: know your numbers, know your A1C, because otherwise an ambulance is going to come crashing through your living room and run over you. This, this, this model that has been developed in diabetes and cardiovascular disease is one that the Alzheimer's field lusts after. If only we could have our number, our measure, our biomarker that people would get that would signify now you need your therapeutic in that theranostic model. Some argue that the likelihood that there'll be just a single number or measures is, is, is unlikely, and instead probably it'll be something more like this. This is the website, FRAX, uh, and this is if you have to pick your country for this, but so if you're an American, you go to this page, you enter your age, your uh, gender, weight, height, whether you've had a previous fracture, et cetera, and you click a button and you get your 10-year risk of having a major osteoporotic fracture or a hip fracture, and then based on that, you make your decision about whether or not to treat. So one, uh, one aspirational goal uh, in the Alzheimer's field is could we get to having this kind of calculator where you would say enter some data like your age, your performance on a memory measure, your APOE gene, and your PET scan for amyloid result, and then you would get your risk over time of developing cognitive impairment, and that would engender whether or not it's worth you being on an, an, a, a therapy, an anti-amyloid therapy. So this, the, these kinds of actuarial desktop futures of medicine are where the Alzheimer's field wants to be. Well, I trust that you've already felt some of the ethical problems of getting there, namely how would you do this research? I've gestured already to studies that involve measuring amyloid, one of the two pathologic hallmarks of the disease in normal people, and then enrolling them in a clinical trial, or measuring dominantly inherited genes or uh, non-dominantly inherited genes uh, that increase your risk. And the question is, is in those studies that enroll persons on the basis of having a gene or biomarker associated with Alzheimer's, is it ethical to tell the person this result as part of the enrollment criteria? criteria into their research. I want to back up and just kind of think about those two broad categories within which we can put Alzheimer's research, observational research and interventional research. And I think that does, I, I want to, depending on your answer to the question I have at the top bullet, there are really two design options that you have. If you don't think that people should know their result, then you need, to base, you need to have designs that use what's called blinded enrollment. In other words, I'm going to test you because I need to know whether or not you're in my cohort or, or going to be in my clinical trial, but I'm going to do it in a way that's going to keep it hidden from you. Okay? And you can do that pretty easily in observational studies. You just don't tell people the results. 
Um, in tr clinical trials, what that would require is having an assigned placebo-only group. So you'd have to take a group of individuals who will test negative, you don't tell them that they're negative, but you enroll them in the study and they're put in a cohort that gets placebo. You don't know that they're in that cohort as the investigator. They don't know they're in it. They, they, all they know is they're getting a blinded study drug. And that allows you to not have to tell people, oh, you're in my study because you had that positive result. That's the blinded enrollment approach. And, and um, the other approach is transparent, where you tell people you have elevated amyloid or you have the APOE4 homozygote gene, and so therefore uh, you're eligible for my trial. So I'd like to sort of make the case that in general I'm going to argue uh, favors, well I think uh, favors transparent enrollment <coughs> designs. And I'll go through that in a minute. The two risks, uh, uh, the key issue here around the risks and benefits at stake, I think with gene disclosure of genetic information, there's obviously the impact on the person of learning that information, but there's also issues around uh, consanguous relatives. Because uh, if, if I tell you you're an APOE4 homozygote, that means if you have consanguous children, they are at least an APOE4 heterozygote, or you may discover they're actually not your children if they choose to go get tested, um, and they're not an APOE4 uh, heterozygote. So that's a very important issue because certainly the uh, 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 people being going into, say, the APOE4 homozygote study uh, are older adults with children, and they're going to say to them, oh, you know, at Thanksgiving, I, I'm joining this clinical trial, uh, and I'm in it because of, I have this gene, and so therefore their kids are going to be finding out that they have the gene. There's another issue, which I think is the biggest issue, and it's why actually we do need to, to generally disclose, which is the psychological harm of disclosure creating the stereotype threat. And I'll show you the results of a study that came out in American Journal of Psychiatry earlier this year. This is a very hard graphic to read given its resolution. But the bottom line in a cohort study, not a randomized design, uh, these investigators disclosed to older adults who are cognitively normal the results of their APOE genotype. So they weren't randomized to disclosure, so you have the biases of confounding by indication. But nonetheless, some got the knowledge of their genetic result, and then they had a comparison control group who didn't know their APOE result. And the take-home message from this study, as shown here, is that those who knew they were an APOE4 carrier rated their memory worse than those who were APOE carriers but didn't know it. And those who were APOE carriers and knew it performed worse on measures of memory than those, who, again, who were APOE4 carriers and did, didn't know it. And this is a literature well described in educational psychology of stereotype threat. If I tell, first described in uh, as studies around uh, African Americans and performance on achievement tests. If you tell someone who's African American, this is an achievement test versus the same test given to them and said this is a test of reasoning ability, they will do worse on it when it's framed as an achievement test. And uh, that, that's been well described in multiple experimental studies. You can do it as well in memory testing with older adults as well. If you tell them it's a very hard memory test, they'll tend to do worse. So the issue that I'm raising here is that if you start telling people their gene or biomarker result, you raise the concern of creating a stereotype threat, that they'll start to incorporate that into their, dare I say, mind, their sense of their cognition, and therefore do worse. So, okay. Let's think about analyzing the risks and benefits back to the two broad categories of studies. Observational studies where the purpose is to observe disease in humans versus interventional studies where the purpose is to observe, uh, uh, treat humans with a disease. In observational studies, I would argue you want to simply look at the effect of disease over time. And so introducing knowledge of your biomarker and stereotype threat could disrupt measures of disease progression. In contrast, in an interventional study, I would argue where it, the future of this study is I will now test people and based on their test result, I will give them a drug. I want to know the compendious effect of not just the intervention, but the knowledge of risk marker on outcome of cognition. And so there's an argument from scientific value to actually test that effect in addition to testing uh, the effect of the intervention you're giving to people. And so it's, in observational studies, I've summed up here, uh, it's a bit of a busy table, but if you look across issues of scientific validity, value, favorable risk benefit balance, and informed consent, I would argue there's a strong argument for blinded designs in observational studies. But I think in uh, interventional studies, you have a much stronger argument for actually transparent designs. Tell people they have elevated amyloid. Tell them they have a double copy of APOE4, unless 
the community of those people who would be recruited make it very clear that they don't want to know that result and there's not a lot of them to recruit from as well, in which case you're just not going to be able to fill your study, which is what's being done in the dominantly inherited studies. However, heartbreaking data I've just learned, many of the people in the dominantly inherited studies are now asking to know what their genotype is because they're tired of the, the, the work of being in the study is so arduous in terms of frequent study visits that they'd like to know if it's worth the risks. All right. We have two studies attached to these clinical trials. I'm sort of an observer of them and hang around them. The first is the Socrates study, the study of knowledge and reactions to amyloid testing. People who enroll in the study in testing elevated amyloid, getting a drug, we are interviewing them about three months into drug treatment and then going back a year later and essentially uh, interviewing a group of non-elevated amyloid older adults to better understand the experience of being told you have this, particularly with an emphasis on the experience of stigma. Who do they tell, what do they tell them, and how do people treat you? For the APOE4 study, we have um, two studies that we're going to be running. One is to remotely disclose APOE results because you can't have a genetic counselor everywhere. I won't talk more about that. But the other is we're going to be testing various interventions designed to reduce stereotype threat to address that very risk I was talking about. Because if the future of Alzheimer's is this preclinical diagnosis where I label you when you're seemingly well, we need to translate that future so that those, that label doesn't itself become a harm, albeit though it will be enjoined to a therapy. Last few points, looking forward to this future. Who will own Alzheimer's? All of those tests I told you, but especially the imaging tests, are owned under the patent laws of America. So too the drugs that uh, are being tested. And that link of the drug and diagnostic, that theranostic, create the opportunity to essentially own Alzheimer's. A very fascinating question going forward. Once you transform Alzheimer's into a preclinical diagnosis on the basis of simple change in a cognitive measure, you have the great challenge of how many people treated for how long with a costly therapeutic and diagnostic. So Alzheimer's disease and its treatment become an economic problem. Autonomy becomes an endless trial in this future of Alzheimer's disease where you're at most mildly impaired. The need for monitoring, if you will, about someone's ability to do things because you're sort of now under the surveillance of medicine and your treatment uh, and being followed up on your yearly basis. Driving laws that require mandatory reporting of diagnoses of Alzheimer's will obviously have to be changed. And finally, living well in the MCI zone is going to be a real issue. If you look at the quality of life measures in people with MCI, they're uniformly worse than normal or AD dementia people. And if we do achieve our goal of prevention, we will be living longer in that zone of mildly symptomatic. Last point, it's a bad disease. This is a patient of mine, 91-year-old woman, lives in an assisted living facility, mini mental of 17, clinical dementia rating of 2, and this is a drawing she did. Now I know what you're thinking. This is, this is a bad disease. This is like you die twice, first in mind and then in body. And, and you have only to look at a drawing like this to say how bad it is, this little horse that she sketches or whatever she did for activities. But actually what this drawing is, is a note that she gave to her daughter. Her daughter wrote me and said, this is a map mom made for me one evening when I visited. She didn't want me to get lost getting to the dining room to meet her at breakfast. The big square is the dining room. The other line is supposed to show turning left at the elevator, again in the hallway. The dining room is on the left, a short walk down the hall. So, it's a bad disease, we don't want to get it, we certainly don't want to die twice, and yet I think it's things like this which remind us of the need to help make sense of Alzheimer's. And so I'll wrap up, just please visit this website we've created to do just that, help make sense of Alzheimer's. I have no more time for questions? Okay, thank you. If you have time for one or two questions, again, please try to keep them short. Racing to the mic. Yes, good. I do have a question. When you compare the study that you presented recently in 2014 to the work by, done by Robert Green on the exact issue yeah. of disclosing genetic information, when we responded with an editorial, we thought for the patients that were in the MCI zone, it was actually beneficial. And we weighed the memory kind of stigma it would present because it is an economic decision when we have a supplement industry that's $33 billion. So I can't remember exactly in the 2014 paper, did they do a pre and post on the memory capability of those patients, or was it simply giving the disclosure of their genetic? It's changed. It's pre-post. 
yeah. pre and post. Yeah. So what was the change over like a bell curve? Because at the time of the 2010, when Green made the decision, it wasn't something that he spurriously did. He yeah. knew perhaps it would bias. Right, so I know you're speaking of the reveal study and Robert Green and I have a trial to test just this issue out. The bottom line is the reveal study studied 40 to 50 year olds and didn't actually measure cognition. So we don't have the ability in the reveal study to know if this bias occurred, unfortunately. And the MCI study we're doing, uh, we also are not measuring cognition. So unfortunately, the reveal studies don't answer this question about the stereotype threat. Yeah. All right, Dan, last, uh, last question, Dan. Yes. Jason, do you, I like to hear some ideas of how you mitigate the uh, stigma of being diagnosed with MCI. Yeah, yeah um, so the stigma of disclosure of uh, a biomarker to cognitively normal people. I don't right. know, that was, is what we're okay. working on. Yeah, yeah, so there is a literature on how to um, uh, de-bias people to uh, stigma. And, uh, uh, it involves essentially, among other things, um, believe it or not, educating them about the presence of this bias and telling them that this can happen. Um, and apparently, when you do that intervention, you can reduce the effect of, of um, stereotype threat on individuals performing on memory measures, for example. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jason. Thank you.